Hey, I just wanted to say um, this is a reading of the new book I'm writing on James Trouble uh, to cover that issue. And I thought I'd read the introduction in a couple chapters. People are asking how I'm doing. And uh, in the next message, I explain it. Um, but we've just been really busy and we had a couple of a medical emergency and surgery for both my wife and the dog. And I just haven't gotten to be able to do YouTube videos for a little bit. But um, I thought, well, I could at least read what I'm working on uh, to give you a kind of taste of what the next book will be. I hope in the next two, three months I'll have something uh, ready to go. And Genesis is complete and people are liking it. So if you haven't checked out the Genesis book, please do. It's uh, different. All right, take care. I wasn't sure if I'd read the introduction, but I feel like I need to. Uh, let's see if I can do The profitable faith catchphrase. I feel the need to summarize some of the main points I've been making about James for a couple years here. In the past, I've suggested that the safest thing to say to a community is that James is just encouraging people to let their faith be profitable to others. However, when you hear so many people repeating the exact same words over and over again, there has to be a source. And we've researched some commentaries uh, and have discovered that this catchphrase is actually a smokescreen for other more damaging doctrines that are no longer safe and have serious implications for a believer's understanding of the gospel. We've also had many conversations with people and have encountered this catchphrase repeatedly. James is just talking about faith that is profitable before men. However, as I always suspected and now have confirmed, this is a smokescreen for a distraction. Uh, a smoke screen or a distraction from a theological position that is contrary to the doctrine of Christ and is damaging to the body of Christ. I've received questions and emails from subscribers and bruised reads who've been hurt by these teachings for years. We've also been the subject of all sorts of accusations from those who initially seem to hold the view that James is just talking about profitable faith, but eventually reveal that they have a thoroughly work-saturated concept of justification and the Christian life. In some ways, how to handle James is a secondary issue and has been treated as such in the past. However, the phrase secondary issue is often used as a cloak for people to bring into agreement with and tolerance for very damaging false doctrine. Because of how this is being handled, I'm no longer willing to say it's a secondary issue, something we can agree to disagree about, to people who've heard my teaching and rejected it or are commenting all over the places about my teach teaching that they've never heard, especially when standing with blatant wolves and deniers of the gospel. Many are now encountering my teaching not in the context of a conversation with my subscribers and readers, but because they've been referred by others who are offended or mischaracterizing what we've said. This book is essentially a collection of the teachings I gave on James over the course of about four years from my channel. First, I will give you an overview of my view on James and most of the points will then be addressed in greater detail in the subsequent chapters. The first time we hear about James in the Bible is the book of Acts chapter 12 when Peter is exiting after escaping his imprisonment. James was the brother of Jesus and was highly uh, respected by various groups including Pharisees, Judaizers, false believers, and genuine believers. He was seen as the next in line for the throne of David and was considered a potential king by some zealots. The rise of James's influence is mysterious due to several factors. First, he's not a disciple during Jesus' earthly ministry, and he even expressed doubts about him, suggesting that Jesus had gone mad. Additionally, James was not among the twelve apostles or a replacement for Judas Iscariot. He did not have the same role or function as an apostle. He didn't go out and raise up churches or evangelize the world. However, despite these factors, James' letter is treated as apostolic, and his influence in church history in the early church is significant. One possible explanation for his rise in influence is his earthly connection to Jesus and his reputation for piety. Being regarded as the brother of Jesus, James may have carried a certain weight in the minds of people who knew men according to the flesh. This connection to Jesus could have elevated James' perceived authority within the early church. However, it's important to note that knowing and evaluating individuals based on their earthly connections or appearances goes against the teachings of Paul, who emphasized not knowing Christ or anyone after the flesh. It's worth considering that James's influence and the weight given to his epistle may not be fully justified or in line with the teachings of the Apostle Paul. The focus on James' earthly connections and reputation for piety may have been overshadowed, may have overshadowed the understanding of Pauline revelation. Paul warned against exalting men urging believers to discern the truth of the gospel and reject false teachings. 
Therefore, the rise of James's influence, while mysterious, can be attributed to factors such as his connection to Jesus and reputation, rather than an apostolic role or alignment with Paul's teachings. In Acts 15, there was significant disputation regarding whether Gentile converts need to follow Jewish laws and customs in order to be saved. The church in Jerusalem, for the large part, took it for granted that they, as Jews, were obligated to the law. In fact, Peter had to correct them, saying, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows their hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did to us, and put a difference, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. Notice the thrust of Peter's argument. It was not just the Gentiles can be saved without law, but that the Jews need to see that they are also saved by faith and must be justified by faith, just like the Gentiles. There's no difference. This is based on Paul's understanding of justification that Peter had learned from him, which presents Christ as the justifier of all the ungodly who work not but believe in Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, with or without the law. The beliefs in Jerusalem were rooted in a mix of faith and works rather than a clear understanding of justification by faith apart from works. The Jewish disciples believed in the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the kingdom and saw Jesus as the Christ who fulfilled the prophecies, but this fusion of Old Testament and the teaching of Jesus contribute to the initial confusion and resistance toward the idea of salvation for Gentiles without adherence to the law. This does not mean they were not saved in Jerusalem, and this discussion is not only about how one gets saved, but how is the Christian life lived. Paul's revelation is that Christ himself is the Christian life in its entirety, our justification, our sanctification, our way, our wisdom, and our life. Summed up in the statement he made in his rebuke to Peter, I through the law died to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but not I, but Christ in me. This is the truth that Paul tells us very clearly in Galatians 2 that he did not have the opportunity to bring to Jerusalem until the Acts 15 conference some 20 years after the origin of the church and a number of years after Paul's uh, James's epistle. James wrote his epistle before Paul's full revelation of the mystery of the church was made known. In the Acts 15 conference, James expresses certain views that reflect the understanding in Jerusalem at that time. He suggests that the Gentiles would eventually have to convert to Judaism, he cites the prophecies of Amos and speaks of the tabernacle of David being raised and the Gentiles coming to it within the context of Gentiles coming to Jews after they enter their kingdom. James uses this prophecy from Amos, which refers to a time when the Lord is reigning on the earth and Gentiles come to learn from Zion during the millennium. What is missing from his understanding is a truth that Paul has not yet revealed, the body of Christ, the new man, in which there is neither Jew or Greek, but Christ is all in all. Also, the fact that Israel has been cut off until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, uh, this was a mystery that was uniquely Paul's to reveal. James wrote his letter to the Jews not because he was their apostle or part of another dispensation, but because he did not yet know what the church was. No one knew what the church was prior to Paul's teaching. However, this interpretation of the prophecy is flawed and indicates confusion on James' part. A compromise was reached among the apostles because they said it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, everyone tends to believe it was inspired. However, the letter that went out contained a residue of Levitical ordinances for Gentiles. James ended the meeting by reiterating that he expected the Gentiles had no need of further instruction since Moses was preached in the synagogues every Sabbath. Um, Therefore, my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from the Gentiles have turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and fornication and things strangled and blood. For Moses of old has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. The church in Jerusalem never grasped Paul's revelation. In Acts 21, Paul returns to Jerusalem by revelation and is met by James and the brothers. They asked Paul to take a vow to show that he is not apostatized from the law of Moses because there were thousands upon thousands in Jerusalem who believe and they're zealous for the law. It must be understood that they were doing this to protect Paul from charges of sedition because the Jewish nation, Moses, represented not only religious but civil law and Paul was being accused essentially of stirring up an insurrection. 
It is also worthy of note that Acts is considered by many to be the trial documents that Luke was preparing for Paul. The book of Acts is not a story about the glorious acts of the early apostles, but the religious background in Jerusalem that led to the false accusation that was laid at Paul's feet. But for us, it gives us the background as to why Paul's revelation was unable to penetrate the early church. The book of Acts, combined with Paul's epistles and the letter from James, gives us the full uh, revelation, the narrative, of the evil workers that capitalized on being from James and from Jerusalem and circulated among the churches Paul raised up, impressing them with their supposed spirituality, law-based obedience, biblical knowledge, while turning the churches away from Paul's ministry and undermining him at every turn in order to bring saints into bondage. This is the real spiritual warfare in the New Testament and it's been going on ever since. James is not the cause of any of it. He is merely a reflection of what was believed at the time in Jerusalem. His letter is what you would have if you did not have Paul's revelation, and it shows the need for it. His letter represents what is known in Jerusalem before Paul's gospel, his teachings on justification, his teachings on our union with Christ, our death with him to sin and to the law, as the basis and foundation of the practical Christian life, as well as his teachings on the body of Christ and the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ, which is a speaking New Testament ministry to distribute the riches of Christ among his co-heirs as enjoyment that brings them into rest. James versus Paul in the Practical Christian Life While many people regard James as the epitome of practical Christian living, it's crucial to recognize the significance of Paul's teachings and the revelation of Christ's death and life within believers as the cornerstone of practical Christianity. Paul's writings emphasize the concept of believers being united with Christ in his death and resurrection, and this union with Christ leads to a transformation of the believer's life and serves as a framework for living out the practical Christian life. In Paul's teachings, the Christian life revolves around reckoning oneself dead to sin and to the law and being made alive to God in Christ. It involves having faith that Christ is in us and our life. Rather than beholding his natural face in the mirror, looking for something to do in order to be blessed, as in James 1, Paul has us unveiled by the law uh, and beholding and even reflecting as a mirror the glory of the Lord illuminated in the face of Jesus Christ as he shines in our heart as a treasure of glory, working himself into us as a weight of glory and diffusing himself as a fragrance through us while riding himself into our being to make us his expression. Those who teach James as the practical Christian life emphasize sanctification by works, but Paul teaches sanctification is a matter of union with Christ, being a vessel, and being supplied by the Spirit through the hearing of faith, also apart from any works. He asks for those troubled in Galatia from Judaizers, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you going to be perfected in the flesh? Our path to transformation is not through works, but through Christ, and it is by faith alone every step of the way. The practical Christian life, as understood in Paul's teaching, goes beyond mere adherence to good works or following instructions. It encompasses a deep understanding of the gospel wherein Christ is the source of both our justification and sanctification. Good works are seen as an adornment to the gospel, preventing people from slandering it, rather than a means for earning justification, attaining any improvement in so-called progressive sanctification. In these teachings, we will explore some of this background and some of the mental gymnastics performed by some Christians to accommodate James, which directly or indirectly subvert Paul's teachings regarding the nature of faith, justification, and the Christian life.